so uh, Dushan was supposed to give this talk, and he apologizes to everybody here uh, for not being able. Oh, all right. All right. Thank you for not being able to make it. Um, but uh, I'll be giving it on his behalf. Uh, it's on work that, that he and I have been collaborating on closely, also with Elliot Quarter and Norm Murray, uh, uh, trying to put more realistic feedback physics into the simulations and make progress sort of starting from small scales and going up um, to inform the kinds of models we've all been talking about. And this is also very much related, and I'll be showing some slides of, of work uh, by Jose Onyorbe that uh, James Bullock also mentioned during his talk. Um, so, no, I don't need to really give the introduction. We know we need feedback to explain the mass function of galaxies or, you know, this plot that keeps coming up, the reason why uh, stellar uh, star formation is so inefficient at low masses. And we think that at low masses, that's stellar feedback. And I won't be talking at all about AGN feedback at high masses. So what's the problem? And we all, again, have repeatedly uh, said this, so I'm just going to move very quickly. The, most of the approaches that we uh, are used to treating in galaxy formation uh, treat stellar feedback as just a thermal energy dump from supernovae, 10 to the 51 ergs per supernova. And as we've all uh, seen and, and has come up repeatedly, that alone in the simplest implementation fails completely. You just radiate away all that energy almost instantaneously. And it gets worse as you go to higher resolution because your stars are actually forming inside of things like GMCs, where the cooling time is 10 to the 4 times shorter than the dynamical time uh, for the post-shock heated gas. So essentially on large scales where we can't uh, incorporate all of the physics of the ISM, we cheat or we insert our subgrid models in one of two popular ways that we've heard about repeatedly. One is uh, you turn off cooling, some variant of blast wave models where you say I'm going to dump this energy in and then I'm going to have some prescription for turning off the cooling time for the heated gas for some period of time after that's injected. Or you just force the winds out by hand. You essentially put in the uh, uh, answer you suspect has to be there. And you say, I'm going to kick particles, say, uh, kinetically. I'm going to throw them into a wind for every unit star I form. And you can do various uh, uh, iterations on that. You can uh, force it to free stream completely out of the galaxy. You can let them shock internally in the galaxy and see what happens. But most of the feedback prescriptions we've discussed, with the exception of some of the really new work that people are talking about that's very exciting, are variants on these. And of course, when you do these things, you can get answers that start to look better. So this is just one cosmological simulation of a Milky Way-like galaxy with no feedback, where everything cools and turns into stars in the first few dynamical times, in the in very early times in the universe. If you just turn on supernova heating with no fudge, uh, just directly putting the thermal energy in, you get this. It doesn't help. Uh, but then, of course, when you use these more uh, elaborate prescriptions, you can get something that looks good. But the question is, are these cheats justified? Are these subgrid prescriptions actually uh, at all related to the real physics of the ISM? So this project uh, has really been trying to use uh, galaxy scale simulations to build up, as I said, to understand the key physics. And so uh, to start with, I'll describe isolated galaxies, but I'll build up to uh, very uh, recent work in cosmological simulations. Uh, but to start, we use isolated galaxies where we can reach parsec scale resolution. You include uh, all the cooling processes you think are important, including some approximations to molecular cooling so you can get gas at very cold temperatures. And you restrict star formation to the very highest densities, corresponding to at least denser regions inside of GMCs where we think stars actually form. Um, and I'll come back to how you implement star formation. Of course, we're still not resolving a protostar in these simulations. Uh, we have to implement some prescription, some subgrid prescription, but I'll, I'll come back to that. But once a star forms, the idea here is we're at this resolution, we should be able to resolve many of the interactions of the relevant feedback mechanisms. So we're just going to put them in straight out of a stellar population synthesis model, knowing the age and metallicity of every star particle, uh, and not introduce any free parameters. So that includes energy and mass and metal ejection every time there's a supernova. Supernova, of course, do happen. Uh, and they carry significant energy with them. There's also stellar winds, which uh, in an integral sense may not have as much energy as supernova, but uh, can be much more important at early times and can carry a much higher power uh, than supernova, actually. And there's also the energy associated with photoionization heating and photoelectric heating, uh, which actually can be significantly, I mean, the actual energy in these terms is much larger than the energy in supernovae. Uh, and so, 
it certainly uh, seems like it could be important, and we've heard already that it can be. Uh, and in addition to all the you know, mass, energy, metal return, there's also explicit momentum associated with all of these terms. And that turns out to be critically important when you start resolving these scales. And there's three main sources of momentum in the simulations that we've been running. There's the momentum of supernova ejecta, the momentum of stellar winds, and radiation pressure that we've heard repeatedly about, which we implement with this simple scaling that, again, we've already talked about, where you have uh, a momentum flux that scales as L over C from single scattering, and this tau IR term if you have multiple scattering in the infrared. Uh, uh, as we discussed, you know, the details of that correction term depend on radiative transfer, so everything I'm going to discuss here is actually not especially sensitive to that. Um, but we can definitely talk about it more later. Um, so what happens in an isolated galaxy when you throw all of these uh, mechanisms in there? Many of you have seen this uh, movie. This is a SMC mass dwarf galaxy uh, simulated at that resolution with all of these feedback mechanisms active. You're looking at the gas, and the blue is cold molecular gas. The pink is warm ionized gas, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5K, and the yellow is uh, hot gas at greater than 10 to the 6K. You very quickly reach some steady state uh, equilibrium or quasi-equilibrium where you have this turbulent ISM where dense regions collapse, they turn into GMCs, uh, they start forming stars in the denser subregions. but once a few percent of the mass in those systems is turned into stars, a combination in this case of warm gas pressure uh, and radiation pressure uh, tears apart those clouds. And then the supernova go off later uh, in real you know, physical time after the star is formed. And when they go off, they're going off in a much more rarefied medium. There's holes that the energy can escape along and couple to these underdense bubbles where it then is able to heat them up efficiently because the cooling time, the real cooling time, is actually longer than the dynamical time. And you see edge on, and I'll show a better projection in color, uh, material venting out then in the hot gas of these uh, bubbles as well as cooler and warmer material being entrained and accelerated by radiation pressure. So what do the star formation rates look like when you implement these different mechanisms? These are four different galaxy models. Remember, we're just doing an isolated galaxy for now, so we take idealized properties. Here's the SMC that we just saw the movie of. This is a Milky Way analog here, MW. This upper right is a dwarf starburst M82 analog. And this high Z model is an attempt to mock up one of these extremely high star formation rate, high surface density, uh, clumpy, high redshift disks. In each case, the purple dotted line is what happens when you have no feedback. No surprise here, it catastrophically uh, uh, collapses at uh, arbitrarily high densities. You basically peak at a star formation rate that's about the gas mass divided by the dynamical time. It's all free falling to arbitrarily high densities. And you only decay because you're run out of gas, basically. Where when we turn all of these mechanisms on, you see a huge suppression in star formation rates. And we can ask which mechanisms dominate under which regimes. So for example, turning on and off different mechanisms one at a time, if we turn off radiation pressure, we see a huge effect in this massive starburst disk. It's nearly as severe as removing all the feedback altogether. And that shouldn't be surprising. I mean, we've already discussed this in other contexts and from other work, uh, but these disks are extremely high star formation rate systems. There's a lot of photons. They're optically thick, so they're trapping those photons. And they're nearly at the dusty Eddington limit already. So it shouldn't be surprising at all that radiation pressure is important. Sorry, so the dotted is no feedback whatsoever, and the solid black is with all mechanisms enabled. And then the red line, sorry, is where I've disabled just radiation pressure but kept everything else active. Sorry, I'm moving a little quick to, to get to the new stuff, but uh, my apologies. Um, on the other hand, if we keep everything else in place and remove heating from supernovae and stellar winds, uh, we see the opposite, where it has very little effect in these massive disks because all that thermal energy is radiated away very efficiently, but it has a much bigger effect in low mass galaxies. I want to stress that even though in this case, if we go back a step to removing radiation pressure, it didn't have much of a, an effect in the dwarf galaxy, we're still including the warm gas pressure from photoionization heating and photoelectric heating, we're still including stellar winds. If I remove all of those mechanisms and only include supernovae, 
even in this dwarf galaxy, it's a disaster. Uh, you radiate away that energy too efficiently because the supernovae are going off inside of the densest regions. So the punchline is that uh, when you do a whole bunch of these simulations, out pops something like the schmidt kennicutt law. This is stellar star formation rate surface density versus gas surface density. This is with no feedback. This is with feedback. And the black lines are the observed relation. Unsurprisingly, without feedback, you grossly overpredict star formation rates. With all these feedback mechanisms present, I was amazed that with no fine tuning, all the parameters that describe these um, feedback mechanisms are coming straight out of Starburst 99. Things pop right onto the relation. You get uh, this, uh, instead of consuming the gas in one dynamical time, you slow it down to 50 dynamical time, or to, yeah, one, one or two percent per dynamical time. And that really is a consequence of feedback regulating against collapse. If you try to collapse more material, it'll turn into stars, they'll push back on the gas, and they'll lower the densities and suppress further collapse. And in the, if that's the case, if it's really regulated by feedback, if feedback is what changed these lines and what determines the equilibrium number of stars that you need to regulate against runaway collapse, then that says something that's very good for those of us working on galaxy scales, or very handy for us, which is that you get an actual predictive star formation rate that's a consequence of feedback independent of the microphysics of how stars actually form. If it's really feedback regulating this and just saying I need this many stars to offset runaway collapse by feedback, then you shouldn't care microphysically how your star formation is implemented. And you can actually see that in these simulations. If you just arbitrarily change the small scale star formation law that all of us doing, playing this game have to implement, it doesn't have any effect on the star formation rates for fixed feedback parameters. So if I do, for example, change in my dense gas uh, where I have some rule for converting gas into stars, I can change the efficiency or the normalization of that law here by a factor of 20. I can change the functional dependence on density, add a temperature dependence if I want. I can change how it depends on the density threshold, what my threshold is for star formation. And in each case, these are just otherwise identical simulations showing their star formation rate versus time with these variations. And you always get the same star formation rate. If I make star formation harder, I just, it just means that more gas will collapse and keep collapsing and keep collapsing until it gets to the threshold where it will make stars. And it will make stars until it makes enough stars to put enough energy back into the medium to stop collapse globally. And so you get converged answers irrespective of the microphysics of star formation, which is very nice for those of us hoping to do this on very large scales. That also saves us from some other horribly painful things because it means up to the regime where cooling is very inefficient, uh, which we just heard about, for example, uh, we don't actually care if we do the chemistry right because things will find a way to collapse as long as there is some cooling channel present and self-regulate. So these are just different models. Sorry, again, plotting star formation rate versus time with models where we just freely change uh, uh, implementations of the chemistry, either ignoring it completely, implementing some approximation for uh, the molecular fraction in the gas and allowing star formation only from that, or attempting to actually self-consistently modify the cooling curve with some approximation of the local chemistry. And they all give you exactly the same answer. Um, Again, this is modulo there existing some cooling channel. It's not that chemistry isn't functionally necessary to get cooling and get high densities, but you can actually get the chemistry quite wrong and still get the right answer. Um, so let's go up in scale and start thinking about what this might mean uh, cosmologically. So very briefly before I show you the actual cosmological simulations, what we're interested in in particular on cosmological scales is getting baryons out of galaxies, right? And we're certainly seeing winds arise in these isolated galaxy simulations. You can ask again what mechanisms are important, and I'll just skip past this. It's essentially the same answer as we saw for star formation. And you can ask for an isolated disk, is the amount of outflow interesting? And it is. This is the ratio of wind outflow rate to star formation rate in these isolated galaxy models as a function of Vmax. And the points are variation, show variation in time with the different models. And the red dashed line is what Ramil Dave puts into his simulations to get a rough match to the stellar mass function. So this is suggestive from the isolated models that maybe we're getting close to including the right span of interesting physics 
that, that we need to explain these winds. But of course, this is really only a statement about what gets out of the disk in a very short-term idealized sense. So, so, not, so the wind, yeah. m dot wind is not measure of the zero wind. Yeah, this is just, wind. it's just the fraction of unbound yeah. material. At, at launch. Yeah, yeah, exactly, at launch. Because there's no halo, I mean, there is a halo, but there's no realistic medium for it to propagate into. Hmm? It's the, well actually, formally this is the flux of material into what's unbound um, above, a, above, it has to be at least one uh, kiloparsec above the disk and be formally unbound. Um, and we, it's just the different, derivative of that mass versus time basically. But if you calculate just the flux through a given radius near the disk, you'll get the same answer, very close. So the project that we've been working on, that Dushan in particular as well as Jose have been working on in very different mass regimes, uh, is to move up to cosmological scales and see if this story at all holds together. Uh, now, of course, we'd like to be able to throw just the exact uh, simulations I showed into a fully cosmological context, and that's not possible at the kinds of resolution we're running. So as a first experiment, we're doing what may be a bad idea, but we're trying to just see if we can use the same prescriptions but get away with slightly poorer resolution. Still good enough resolution that we formally resolve the gene's length in the gas in these disks, but certainly not as good as one parsec. 20 to 50 parsecs for the simulations I'm going to show you. Um, now, here's an example, and everything I'm saying now is incredibly work in progress, so take it all with grains of salt. Uh, this is a simulation by Dushan of what would be at Z of zero, a roughly Milky Way mass galaxy. This is the IgM density and temperature in a 200 kiloparsec uh, physical box. Uh, and you can see uh, at early times, these small galaxies form and you get little bursts of star formation that lead to massive outflows um, and propagate out quite far into the IgM. This simulation is only run up to Z of 2.5 because again, our resolution uh, starts to, at this, Redshift, we start failing to resolve the genes lengths in the disk. So I wouldn't trust any of our prescriptions to be particularly meaningful uh, as we've implemented them. But it's clear that feedback is having a strong effect. You can look at some initial properties of the galaxies that are forming. Uh, you get at this time, there's you know, a disk very similar to some of the simulations we've uh, seen from many of the groups here uh, today. Uh, the stars are here trying to do a crude separation into bulge and disk. Um, and you're starting to get something interesting. And again, we've seen many examples of other simulations that have shown results like this. But again, the key here is there isn't a subgrid step between the parameters that are coming straight out of stellar population synthesis and what goes in as the feedback prescription. And this is the stellar mass halo mass relation we're getting for the subhalo or for the different halos in the box at this time. Um, you know, we haven't done any good comparison with observations, so I don't actually know. This is also a Z of four. We don't have great observations. Um, but at least at these redshifts, you know, it's not suffering, it seems, from the problem of at very high redshifts radically running away. Now, I'm not really focused here. The, the goal of this project is not to produce the best Milky Way that's ever been simulated. What we really want to understand is how these different prescriptions matter or don't matter and how this compares to other ways of doing this. So certainly, you get very different answers if you include feedback versus if you drop it entirely. So this is that same simulation with the feedback prescriptions I've been describing, looking again at the IgM temperature, and with no feedback, just using uh, this simple Springle and Hernquist prescription to pressure uh, effective equation of state for the cold star forming gas. And no big surprise here, there's no outflows generated, et cetera. That's not shocking. But what was a little more surprising was Let's try the experiment of take the same initial conditions of our model with feedback, and let's run a model where we use this simple wind model where we just kick particles at some rate proportional to the star formation rate. And what's more, let's pick a rate that matches what we measure in this simulation. We'll force it to basically give the same integrated ratio of uh, star formation to baryonic uh, inflow or outflow. And this is what we get when we get the this is the subgrid wind model on the left, and this is the more explicit resolved model on the right. What you can see is the evolution is really radically different. And it's, I apologize, uh, you know, you can see it even better contrast on the laptop. But with 
the full feedback, you see the star formation histories are much burstier. The winds really rip out to much larger radii. The thermal structure of the IGM near these galaxies is significantly different. Um, and you can see that quantitatively in a number of manifestations. So this is the star formation history as a function of redshift. The red line is with no feedback. Okay, it runs away, no big surprise. The black line is with feedback and it's you know, crazy bursty. Uh, um, you can see how ridiculously small the time steps get by the line here. Um, simulation actually stopped for a month at Z of 4.9 when it decided to form a star cluster. Um, the, uh, blue, the green and blue lines here though show what we get if we implement this subgrid wind model with a couple of minor differences in the implementation. And these are, by design, they get the same average star formation history, more or less. But you can see they wipe out all of this interesting bursty structure. So I'm not saying that this means that every subgrid model out there is wrong, but it's, it clearly highlights the fact that you know, getting the right integral answer for these simple prescriptions doesn't mean that you're actually getting the right dynamics. And how you implement these feedback models, not just you know, what their integral effect is, can have huge effects on your conclusions. Um, and I'll just say that that's true too for isolated systems. If we run even a super high resolution galaxy merger, we get very different star formation histories. And in the last uh, uh, slide I'll show, I'll just mention, we've talked a lot about uh, these uh, uh, cores or lacks of, lack of cores and halos. Uh, we've very briefly started to look at this and uh, we have one example that we looked at, that Dushan looked at. And, it was a big core appearing, we were very excited. And then we looked at the other halo of the same mass in the simulation, and there was no core in that one. And then Jose looked at his simulation, which James talked about, and there was no core in that one. And then we looked at the core that we had seen evolved to a later time, and the core seems to be going away. I think there's very much, you know, uh, we should just bear in mind that this is still a very uncertain thing. And what this highlights, again, I'm not saying cores do or don't form, but I am saying how they form and whether they form may be sensitive to the actual detailed dynamics of feedback, not just the integral result of how much mass gets pushed in or out of these galaxies. Do you see any difference in the core depending mm -hmm. on whether you have the burst the star formation yeah, yeah. So versus the average? I, I tried to get that plot. Uh, I didn't get a chance to. So. Uh, I would love to know the answer, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll just leave my conclusions up there. Okay, thanks, Phil.